So, it, you guys, it's your turn to talk. Uh, oh, Frank. I want to follow up on what Barbara said because my, when I first heard about Occupy Church and Occupy Faith and Occupy Catholic, it was all on Twitter. And, and I, so I was only seeing the names, and I was under the same impression. I thought, great, these are groups that are occupying you know, those faith institutions. Um, and, you know, and I'm very interested in church reform. Um, but also, uh, on, I work on sexuality issues. But um, it, another thought that I had when I first heard about it was that it was going to be Occupy movements about economic justice in churches, getting churches to divest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not just the <laughs> grassroots democracy piece, but but as as Jeremy said, the church's in, implication and in intertwining with economic structures. Right. You know that it, that is right. so uh, prevalent that the, that churches themselves are not the models of of divestment or or their economic policy. Is there anything uh, in your movements that's that's um, aiming at those goals? Yes, um, the finance, the financial activism component that we're we're working on is is directed at a move your money campaign, um, and as well as um, but there there are, there are also um, as as I've found that there are um, there you know it's it's like you so part of the problem is that. You know, as we, as I'm investigating some of this stuff, is that there aren't like in terms of divesting from these publicly traded companies, there's not always these really positive alternatives that you can put your money into. And so, like we come, we've kind of been like as we've thought through this, we're like we actually need to create these kinds of things. So, if churches can like find ways to make these small scale projects that are actually economically viable, then they can invest into their own mm -hmm. projects. So that's that's kind of where we've gone with that, um, and that, that they can invest resources in. But also, like yes, the move your money campaign is is important. Um, protest chaplains was kind of like steered. Away. They were kind of like, eh, we aren't going to do so much. So it's kind of like, that got put on the table as a, like a lar like a larger movement goal, and they were kind of like less interested in that. Um, and move your money is like really move your money on a personal basis is really short term, and it doesn't have a huge impact. Like. And, and and church divestment can and like church church activism, but like one of the things we're talk, we've been talking about is um, to talk about uh, <coughs> training a core and you know training a core, like training your church to do grassroots activism, grassroots financial activism. So um, there's definitely there's definitely that is still there. It's just that we need to find. Um, I think Andrew's Andrew's um, the point person for our committee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And actually, and I'd like to add a, a little bit um, on what that looks like. You know, we we mentioned the cooperative model, and that's that's a specific democratic form of business that has a lot of resonance with with the early church, and that's something that you know where it does sort of start becoming a little bit of an occupied church, where you remind people, like, well, you know, it says in the Book of Acts that when there was discussion over how to take the collective purse. The apostle said, "Well, this is not our job. Let's elect somebody to do that." You know, and that—that's economic democracy right there. Um, and so, so kind of like reminding church hierarchies as spiritual organizations. Well, that's not necessarily their role to control the money. They have to like provide the space for it to be done by the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that we're doing at Occupy Faith DC is. We're in the process of developing like a, a code of ethics slash values uh, as a proclamation uh, for uh, communities of faith. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to send it around. We're in the process of revising and getting as many voices as possible into this conversation so that we can have uh, faith communities sign on to it. And we want to uh, start that effort. We've already started the beginning, but this effort is going to accelerate uh, this spring through the spring and into the summer and, and for the rest of the year. Uh, so um, that's one of the things we're doing just to start to raise consciousness about uh, the importance and the need to reestablish a voice, uh, a value-based voice uh, that uh, deals with the issues of inequality. Uh, so we feel that that's very important. And so we're moving 
uh, more closely in, in that regard. And uh, this will be reinforced during our Economic Inequality Weekend. So we hope to have it in, unveiled. Uh, in, so that would be, I guess, about eight, eight, seven, eight weeks from now. Um, so that, that's one of the things that we're, we're looking at directly. Um, I'm, you, you raise your hand. OK. So um, there's, there's a lot to be said about the need for people of faith, and this, you know, in the United States, we're talking, uh, the overwhelming majority of folks are Christian. I'm a Christian myself, uh, but I generally, I feel very comfortable working in interfaith context. Um, but, you know, I talked a little bit about the spiritual awakening and the need uh, for faith communities, especially the church, to remain relevant in the lives of the people whom they uh, purport, or who we purport to serve. And if you can't stand at this moment of, of carnage economically with, with the majority of the American public, then what is your value? Uh, I think, you know, there is a very strong conversation also to be had about the complicity of our faith institutions with the other rich and powerful people who uh, exist and who are uh, really feeding this, this uh, redistribution of wealth. And the fact that a lot of our faith communities have not stood up and have sort of given, I don't want to say sanction, that's too strong of a word, but have been docile in the face of this, this uh, effort. And we have pretty much you know, rubber stamped a lot of the policies, a lot of the approaches that have, uh, in, in essence, a lot of our institutions have become corporatized, you know, in quotes, themselves. <laughs> and you can find, not just in the faith community, but in the nonprofit community, in the charity community, folks are golfing at the same golf clubs. I mean, the, the top, you know, whether it's university presidents, Pastors, I mean, there's like, they seem to sometimes have more in common at the, you know, the ones at the top of these pyramids than they do with their individual communities that they are uh, beholden to, especially at the lower end. So this is a very, very um, <coughs> uh, uh, strong dynamic that has to be confronted. And, you know, we're just now at the stage, you know, of, of starting to develop the conversations around that. Uh, because there's a, it's rich there, and I think that there's a lot of potential if, as we move further into that conversation to draw a lot more people in who themselves have thought these things privately but have not always found the forums and the spaces to uh, express it. Leanne? Um, I'm curious about sort of the messiness that you guys talked about. Why not <laughs>
okay, like, look, it's not okay for you to be sexist, it's not okay for you to be homophobic, it's not okay for you to be racist. Like, we try to create, like, a facilitation structure that allows a lot of people to talk. Um, and, you know, I'm just sitting here as a white guy talking. You know, also white guys sometimes get to talk, but... Um, <laughs> but we can't let them talk too much. <laughs> um, so, 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 but, like, you know, it, it, we, and I think that part of the transformational nature of the part, part of building a community when it's rooted in love and peace and justice is it is transformational and it nurtures people and brings healing. And I think that's the goal and that's part of the reason why we have, why we identify ourselves with all of the political goals of the occupation, work closely with them, but yet are not the occupying movement itself. Because we, for instance, at the church, we believe that in drawing away from the world, like with its brokenness, and trying to create that <coughs> community based on our values of, of, of these justice so so for me like we do that like we can work on those like it's yes the process should be transformational and so that's kind of what I think that's why we stepped back because the process was not transformational it was a lot of really angry people like talking about stuff and we needed yeah. to take a step back yeah. and so we, we that's why we implemented our Quaker processes like that our spirit process of spiritual discernment our processes of community in, in our group because and, and, and when we work with Occupy Our Homes, like our goal is to try to help make that organization more whole by providing facilitation, by providing a sort of spiritual like and and emotional support, and like also helping them with the anti-oppression frameworks. Um, and like yes, um, creating a welcoming community for all people. So that is like part of our mission. Mm -hmm. and it has to be. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of you don't know me. I'm Jolly Pomelo from the Ego Center. I work. I'd like to shift things a little bit. Uh, first of all, Lauren, I'd like to congratulate you on your wonderful, wonderful photography. Thank you. It's beautiful. <laughs> I'd like to comment particularly on this one. <laughs> I'm sure it was no accident that they were playing Monopoly. I mean, <laughs> however, however, I'll just as an interesting tidbit, Monopoly was begun nearly a hundred years ago, a few blocks away from here in Brentwood, by a woman who was poor and did make the game up as her protest against the inequality that people had on wealth. Mm -hmm. And so eventually she sold it to somebody and then Parker Brothers got it and made mega millions out of it. <laughs> <laughs> So I just I just delighted to see that photograph. <laughs> we all thought it was ironic, but it was happening. <laughs> well, if you play Monopoly, and I bet you all did as kids, the Still idea do. was to get those hotels. Yeah. <laughs> Start charging the money. And charge the money and let Baltic Avenue go to the poor. <laughs> well, you know, if, I, if I could just say something which is very ironic about this photo, this was taken at Luther Shelter. Place when uh, we were providing shelter for those who had just gotten kicked out of the encampment. So this was like within at least 24 to 72 hours, they started playing Monopoly at Luther Place. They, there was a hostel there and we were kind of hosting them. So uh, it was very, there's a lot of irony. To <laughs> well, I can add to that story because I learned about it in my 19th century church history course. Hmm. And that was what it was but uh, it, it, it named the, the woman, and she was uh, a friend of this philosopher, a 19th century who were uh, opposed to the ownership of land. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, their thesis was that all of the natural resources belong to the earth and to, to everyone, and that no one owns the land. And their theory was that um, the community owns the land, but you can rent the land from the community. So you pay, you can have your building, but you pay rent for the land, and then it goes into a general fund. And uh, this game was devised to show what happens when there's individual ownership of land. How land then gets accumulated into the hands of a few. And, and that's contrary to the, uh, 
There's, there's a pretty good Wikipedia article with pictures in the early version of it. Uh -huh. We'll probably have a link to whoever she is. And, yeah. I don't know. I just read about it in some of that book. I'm interested in hearing uh, a little bit, um, since you're an artist, and um, uh, many of us were so deeply involved and entrenched and, you know, doing something. But what, what were some of your perspectives and what were some of your uh, views? At, because, you know, you had, you know, you, you didn't just take these pictures during, you know, because like I'm thinking of this one, I mean, this one was, I mean, I can think of the actions. I mean, I was on the other end of the camp screaming when they were hitting people with billy clubs saying, you're hitting Jesus. But, um, but I mean, like you're taking these pictures and all of these things have very, very deeply emotional um, things, but you're an artist and then you're going back and you're you're putting prints together. So what are some of the things that, that you know you learned in that process? Um, well as I said I'm, I'm interested in seeing how faith is lived as opposed to like just the documents. Also I think it definitely taught me a lot about that. Um, in particular um, I think the eviction or when the police kicked people out of the parks was that that was almost that was a very um, meaningful experience for me because I, like, I, there was just this tremendous outpouring of support for these people. You know, like I've been hearing. I mean, like I've been spending. I've gone to a lot of death by church meetings, and everyone's talking about you know justice practices and um, you know that that as one of the goals of the outcry movement too. But like I originally, like I think I was. A lot of people felt that like what, what what's the goal you know like what is like the concrete thing but that was a concrete thing for me when I saw that you know and like when people, they were going from shelter to shelter um, being supported by by faith so that I don't know if I really answered your question but <laughs> <laughs> um, I just I just was learning about like faith in action and like how like something concrete and that's basically what this whole project has taught me is like seeing the like, story outside of like the actual religious institution so I guess I'd say. And when, when Lauren brought the work to us one of the you know the process of, of selecting which I mean she had a lot of work um, and there were lots of different ways to decide but one of the things that developed as we selected <coughs> images the first thing we went by was um, what immediately captured something within us as the viewers, uh, um, which, which images were so strong that something came through without any words necessary. And, and when we selected the work that we did, what we saw develop is this really beautiful um, relationship between community and, um, and the private prayerful moment. And that there is a there's a time for the man in the tent, um, for this gentleman here, uh, for that gentleman in the corner to be navel gazing, to be praying, to be um, contemplating, and then there's another time for community services, um, for action with the protest, um, for playing Monopoly, um, and and we felt really strongly about the the way that those two pieces needed one another. We need to have that time within, and then we need to have the time to come out. And, and I think you know, one of the things that I've noticed as an artist myself, and then as the, the director of artworks, is that um, as the artist, we see what we see, but sometimes we don't, um, it's, sometimes it's really nice as an artist to hear from other people what they see and how things come together because it doesn't always it's not it's not a luxury that you get especially I think as a photographer you're busy you know making the images and and ca capturing what's happening in the moment and then I think it takes a long time to process you know I, I still as a painter learn from paintings I did 20 years ago so I would imagine you have the same I, sense. Yeah, I go back through work that I shot like five years ago and I look at it now, I'm like, why did I not take that picture before? And just like, right? right, right. I see things totally differently and you see the narrative develop over time. 
So. Yeah, and I think that it really is reflective of the whole process, um, the way that we actually chose a lot of the work. So it, it worked together, and they are really beautiful. Um, are there any other any other questions? It's time to um, have something to drink and eat. <laughs> Occupy the food table. <laughs> um, so I want to just say. Um, Thank you again to everyone on the panel and for all of you for coming. Um, you. Those of you who came in late, um, I'm Barbara Johnson. I'm the founding director of Artworks. And I just want to say a word about Artworks. Um, I believe it was Jeremy that talked about um, the revival happening when the spirit comes together with social justice. And I felt like that really spoke to something that I want to say to you about Artworks. And that is that we, um, I founded Artworks um, a couple of years ago as a way to bring together um, the spirit of art and social justice. And so what we do here is we teach classes to everyone from, well, we have toddlers who are this big come in and experience paint for the first time. Um, but we also teach classes to children, teens, and adults in a, in a way that is based in social justice. So we don't teach them, we do teach them that red and yellow make orange, but we do that in a way, in a context that gives them, um, that, that, that ha has them creating meaning. Mm -hmm. that we, we teach them about meaning making and, and about the issues that are relevant to them and a lot of times they get to decide what they are. So we set up a framework, framework and then we move with them, and we a lot of what we do with our students is, um, for example, a workshop that I do on Thursday nights is everyone comes in individually, and they my job is to facilitate the growth of their voice, the development of their creative voice, and so that's sort of the overarching thing, reason we're here, and and the reason why we developed the Art Matters the gallery was um, was to provide an opportunity for things just like this. Um, as well as to encourage um, emerging artists to exhibit. So um, we have a brochure and we have a sign-up sheet around the corner. We'd love to, to invite you to, to leave your email address and anything you might be interested in. Um, and to take our brochure, and if you are part of an organization where you think someone, you know, you might want to take a few, please, please do that. Um, we're going to be at two different um, events in the next couple weeks. Tomorrow we're doing Chalk for Peace, which is um, at the Tacoma Park Farmers Market. And um, the idea is for everyone to pick up some chalk and draw legally on the sidewalk. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and to draw images of peace. And that's, that's at the Tacoma Park Farmers Market in downtown old uh, Tacoma Park. And that's from 10 to 2 tomorrow if you'd like to come and draw with us a little bit. And then in two weeks, on the 28th, we're, um, we're going to be participating in the Build a Better Block project, which um, has a lot of, uh, you know, common goals in that, uh, you know, Mount Rainier has suffered a, a lot of, um, you know, economic, you know, one blow after another in this community. And the idea behind the Build a Better Block project, which is a little challenging to say at times, uh, <laughs> is, um, is for us to sort of take over um, our community and create what we want and to envision and inspire um, conscious development um, in a way that is really community based. So it's a great program and we're excited to be part of that. Um, is there does anybody have anything else they want to say? You just yeah, missed? if anyone who's interested in Occupy Church or Occupy Faith DC, we have a little sign up sheet. Or, uh, and if you leave your name and your phone or email address, we'd appreciate it and we'll be back in touch with you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, thank you guys very much for coming. Thank you. Sure, it was great. I'm really happy to have you guys. Beautiful stuff. Thanks for hosting. It's my pleasure. Really, I mean, literally, when Lauren contacted us, I was like, uh, how soon?